We'll be starting this session in just a moment. If you have any connection or technical issues, try refreshing your browser first. If this doesn't work, please go to the help desk by clicking sessions on the left or click the people tab on the right and search help desk to send a private message. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Chi, Director of Programs and Special Projects for the Strategic Initiatives Group here at the CIA. Thank you to our break sponsor, Smithfield, for their support of Worlds of Flavor. Let's check out this video from them. Tasty tacos from Korea, shareable snacks from south of the border, and breakfast burritos from Bombay. Today's American eaters continue to indulge their cravings for exciting international food trends. At Smithfield Culinary, our Global Taste Initiative presents operators with the products, insights, and ideas to bring an ethnic flair to a variety of customer offerings, from breakfast to barbecue to snacking. Come along with us and take away some worldwide inspiration for your global menu. Don't miss our Around the Globe, Around the Clock culinary adventure with Smithfield Culinary Presentation on Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Thank you so much, Smithfield. I'm excited to check out that session tomorrow. Before we jump into the second half of today's programming, a reminder that registered attendees can access all of the videos, PowerPoints, and recipes on our website, worldsofflavor.com, with the password that was emailed to you earlier this week. And now I'm so excited for this next session where we have an incredible lineup of chefs who are pulling back the curtain and giving us a sneak peek into their kitchens. First up, we're jetting over to Morocco, where Tara Stevens is an author, chef, food and travel journalist, and the executive chef at El Fen, a boutique hotel in Marrakesh, Morocco. Hi, Tara. Hi. Hi. Um... Nice to be here, uh, or to virtually be here. Yes, we're glad you're able to join us. Tell us a little bit about what's going on over there. Well, I mean, I haven't been able to do a conventional kitchen tour because, um, as you know, and many of you probably know, I have a cooking school in Fez, which is currently closed. I'm not too sure when that will reopen, but it will. Um, in the meantime, I've taken a position as executive chef at El Fen, but we're right in the middle of a major renovation and extension program. So we're operating out of a tiny little kitchen on the rooftop. Um, so I decided the best thing to do would be to make you a video that just shows a little bit about what we do and the new concept that we're developing um, to roll out here as soon as we're able to open, which we hope will be sort of around the beginning of December, but obviously everything is quite changeable at the moment. Um, there's still a lot of building work going on. Uh, so yeah, so we're, we're in this state of flux at the moment, but um, we're, we're getting there and I'm super, super excited about it. I mean, it's something, something that I'm really passionate about doing um, in terms of developing plant forward menus and things like that. Um, it's in a place that I love. I love the ingredients and stuff of Morocco. And it's such a spectacular hotel and restaurant to be in. Um, so it just feels kind of um, a complete gift to have such a project going on in these strange times. That's amazing. Well, we'll cross our fingers that you're able to reopen it soon and we'll have to get an update from you once you are totally open again and all the construction is done. Um, so let's check out this video that Tara recorded for us showing us um, some of the highlights from the new menu she's working on. <laughs> Hi, Worlds of Flavour. I'm really sorry not to be with you in person this year, but I am super excited to be coming to you from my new role as Executive Chef at El Fen in Marrakesh. And I wanted to show you around my kitchen a little bit and tell you what we're doing. 
I'm actually developing a new concept for the menu, which is going to be about 75% plant-based. And we're building that on really key components of the Moroccan kitchen. And what I love so much about cooking in Morocco is this very exotic, romantic aspect of the cuisine, um, not to mention the location. Um, to talk you through some of our key ingredients, we confit garlic every morning, and that's just very, very slowly cooked in olive oil. We use a lot of harissa, which is a Tunisian paste, but um, it's been adopted very enthusiastically in Morocco. At its most simple, it's just chilies and salt and olive oil. We add a little bit of rose water to it to give it this um, roundness and a softness that you don't have otherwise. Preserved lemons, of course, absolutely essential in any Moroccan kitchen, and you really can't replace them. Um, you, it, it, they, they have a very distinctive taste, and it is literally as simple as you stuff a lemon with salt, uh, leave it for about four weeks, and away you go. Then, of course, there's our spice cupboard. Turmeric, cumin, ground ginger as opposed to fresh ginger, paprika, uh, harissa again, but this is the dry version of it, and cinnamon. And to that, we'll add a lot of nuts, a lot of grains, a lot of pulses, and of course, um, beautiful olive oil, which is very, very grassy and fruity here. Argan oil from the south and flower waters. Uh, traditionally, rose water and orange blossom water. And all of those ingredients really build our menu every single day in lots of different ways. And I'm gonna show you today our lunch menu. We do five salads every day and a dessert of the day. Um, they're completely vegetarian and then you can just add a meat or fish dish if you want to. But the idea really is that they're hefty enough and interesting enough and lively enough that you really don't miss the wheat at all. Uh, we have here a chamula roast cauliflower. There's lots of different ways of making chamula. We do it with paprika, cumin, turmeric, fresh coriander, a little bit of harissa and olive oil and salt. So that's roasted until it's caramelized together with chickpeas, cherry tomatoes, and onions. We put it on a bed of orange cumin romesco, that's an almond-based sauce, and then we finish it with a yogurt sauce. That was a very quick rundown. I invite you all to come see me here. I would absolutely love to see you. Have a great day, everybody. Have a great conference. See you next year, I hope. Thank you so much to Tara Stevens for joining us. And now we're jumping over to Oaxaca, Mexico, where Susanna Trilling is a chef, teacher, caterer, author, TV hostess, food consultant, and director of Seasons of My Heart Cooking School. Um, and it looks like she's all set to go. Hi, Susanna. Hi, how are you? So great to have everybody. Welcome to Seasons of My Heart Cooking School. Come on in. I'd love to have you. I'm so thrilled. This is the first time we've had students since March. So um, this is our sala. This is our school that um, we have people coming really from all over the world. People come here. The students come here and look at their, um, their recipes. We have lectures. And then we come here and eat afterwards. And then I'd like to show you. This is uh, from Day of the Dead. We just finished our celebration from Day of the Dead. And uh, we didn't have any students this year, but we wanted to all, our team wanted to build the altar together. And you can see from the altar, all the influence of the food. We have the bread and the chocolate and mole and all the fruits and vegetables because the idea of the altar is to enhance the dead ancestors to come back and party with us. So we put on their favorite foods and um, that's how we celebrate. So come on, I want to show you. This is the part of the kitchen where we do all the hands-on cooking. Um, we usually do six recipes per day. These are some of the products from Oaxaca, has more um, microclimates than any other state. So certain things are just made here in Oaxaca. This is piloncillo, this is coffee. This is one of our biggest exports here. These are some of our products that we produce here at Seasons on My Heart. We have mole paste, jellies, and chocolate. And speaking of chocolate, I want to show you this is the jarra that we cook the chocolate with. And this is the molinillo. And we use the molinillo. It's like a Mexican whisk. And we whip foam in the chocolate drink. And then I wanted to offer you some chocolate and bread because that's how we receive people when they come. Um, bienvenidos. 
So we have the bread and the chocolate. And this bread is from Day of the Dead, and it has little dead people in there. <laughs> no, just the idea of them. And so um, coming over here, the backbone of our food is the corn, beans, and squash. It's the holy trinity of the Mexican kitchen. And we have different types of corn here. One of my favorite utensils is a pot like this, and this is how we cook our beans. Uh, it's in the shape of a boot because we also make tortillas or toast chilies. This is a clay comal, and we use firewood. So we put the comal over the firewood, and then we tuck the bean pot underneath and make the beans and the tortillas at the same time. So it's kind of sustainable that way for the firewood. And we have masa. We use um, nixtamal, which is corn that's cooked with calcium oxide. And then we roll it after we grind it in the mill. We roll it into a ball and press it out. And then we press it on the tortilla press. And they say we call this a carita, like a little face. And they say in every tortilla, there's a face inside. I already have one here pressed. So we press it out. And then we would cook it here on the comal and like this. And this is really what we eat every day. And then we keep them warm in these beautiful embroidered servietas. So I would like to invite you to have um, a chapulín. These are grasshoppers. This is really the emblematic dish, I think, of Oaxaca. They're caught in the alfalfa or the um, corn fields, and they're in their season right now. They're cooked with, we cook it with garlic, chili, salt, and lime juice. And they're just eaten with, um, in a tortilla, fresh tortilla with guacamole. And you just eat that and it's really nutritious and delicious. We also have, we grind all our spices. We use only whole spices. We grind them in, this is the molca jefe. They're made from volcanic stone. And this is called a tejalote. And this is used to grind. And so we, we grind our spices and we make a salsa and take the salsa right to the table. So Susanna, this is where we all I... work. Yeah. I am afraid we are actually at time already, um, which is amazing oh. because we haven't gotten to, I feel like we've only gotten just a quick glimpse of the kitchen, but I see now that we're seeing um, the rest of the workstations and we've got the chiles, but yeah. unfortunately we've got to continue okay. on our global itinerary. So thank you again, Susanna, so much for joining us so much. Um, from Oaxaca. Thank you everybody for coming and enjoy the conference. Thanks. Thank you so much, Susanna. This is definitely a whirlwind tour we're doing here. So now let's hop over the international dateline and we're gonna join Kazumi Masuda in Tokyo where it is quite early in the morning. Uh, Kazumi is founder of Tokyo Cook, a cooking school in Tokyo, which is part of her cousin, Chef Daisuke Nomura's restaurant. Hi, Kazumi. Hi, how are you? I'm at Chef Nomura's restaurant, Sogo. Hi. That's Chef Nomura. I'm happy to show you my kitchen, my secret kitchen inside his restaurant. That's, that's there. This place is used for cooking classes for international students. And then also uh, for more personal use, I and Daisuke enjoy some recipe development here. I'll give you a quick tour. Um, the sticks on the wall, there's a soba sticks. Um, we can make fresh soba noodles here. And here I'm making dried persimmons and I have Japanese knives and some wooden tools and some seasonal produce like yuzu. And today I'd like to show you my kombu kelp collections. So this is kombu kelp. Sorry, it's in the plastic bag. Um, kombu kelp is a key ingredient to make Japanese soup stock, but we also eat. So we have variation in kombu kelp product, like this. This is, these are my favorites. Um, this is something we can sprinkle directly on the food. This is a salted one and this fragile ribbon type is good to enjoy with soup. 
And here I draw one of the test like homebrew menu. Homebrew pressed um, food is one of the um, food preserve, preserving technique in regional side of Japan. And it's usually um, used for um, keeping fresh sashimi long, but why not with vegetable and fruit, right? So we are now testing with um, <laughs> persimmons and seasonal radish. So um, Chef Nomura is presenting modern type of shojin ryori. Um, by his approaching is to apply um, traditional Japanese technique to food which has not been really used for uh, traditional Japanese dishes. So it's very important for us to find new and um, fun and tasty uh, ingredients combination. And here next to me, Chef Nomura is making pretzel sushi. By the way, he's chef, but he is my assistant in my kitchen. I'm a chef. <laughs> and this sushi is to simply enjoy um, the flavor of Japanese green pepper and uh, umami from kombu kelp. He's using this type of kombu kelp. It's very core part of kombu kelp. Yeah. <laughs> this is vegetable sushi. <laughs> so, um, simple, clean, beauty dishes to enjoy seasonal flavor, like, I mean, seasonal produce is the fundamental of Japanese cuisine. But we are trying to create something like, like fun elements to it in this kitchen. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. This was beautiful, Kazumi. <laughs> I'm afraid we need to hop back on our plane to jump on to our next kitchen. But oh, what a beautiful, what a beautiful ending! Thank you so much, Chef. Both yeah. chefs, the assistant and the master chef, there. Um, thank you so much. Last but certainly not least, we are heading to the um, home of Musa Dagdabirin, who is certainly no stranger to world's flavor. It's truly the middle of the night in Istanbul, so hopefully he's had a few Turkish coffees to keep him going. Musa is the chef owner of Chia Sofrasi, and this evening he's joined by his friend and translator, Barak Ipir. Welcome, Musa and Barak. Thank you. Thank you. Merhabalar. Ee, Hello everybody. Şu anda ben e, size e, evde kütüphanedeyim. Mutfakta değilim uh, maalesef. So Chef Musa ee, is currently not in the kitchen but he's uh, broadcasting out of his library at home. E, e, kü kütüphanede bir size e, Üzüm terlemesi diye bir bir şey göstereceğim. So he's going Üzüm to show a different technique of uh, how to uh, make prepare grapes, and this dish is called sweating. Literally, he's going to sweat the grapes with this technique. So he puts them in a bowl. Ceviz, walnut. Adding walnuts to it. Diamond. Pul biber. Turkish uh, pepper. pepper flakes. Salt. Marash pepper. Evet. Salt. And then he covers it with this cloth. Bezle, patiska bezle. Kapatıyorum. Bu terleme olayı şu bezin ıslanmasına kadar şu işlemi yapmam gerekiyor. So he shakes it rigorously as you can see until the top of the cloth is moist like it's sweated. It has to be it has to look like it's completely wet on top of the cloth. Bunu özellikle hamile kadınlar e, yapıp yer 
So, and uh, he, he's observed pregnant women enjoy this dish. Çok az üzüm pekmezi yine tekrar. And he's adding, uh, finishing it with some great molasses on top. Evet, böyle bir yemeğimiz oldu. So, bon appetit. Enjoy. Görülüyor mu bilmiyorum. Görülüyor, görülüyor. Teşekkür ederiz. Şimdi Burak bir tane de bir tane de çok eski Neolitik dönemden bugüne e, bir e, yonkulmuş kaya parçasından e, pişirilen yemek ve ekmek e, kabını göstereceğim. Adı so he, he's going to show a, a stone that uh, is from the you know from very old from the Neolithic time period a stone that is used to cook different foods and also bake a bread it's called the pileki stone bu, and it is on the northern part of turkey bu, bu ülkemizde karadeniz bölgesinde yapılan bir şey yeah, again uh, it's it's used in the black sea coast and is the uh, uh, is the bread uh, on top of the stone Aa, şey soruyor Jackie, yani ekmek bunun ocağın üstünde mi pişiyor, ocağın üstünde pişiyor değil mi bu? Evet, bu ateşte önce e, bu ısıtılıyor, bu kap ısıtılıyor, plek ısıtılıyor. They first warm the, warm the rock up on, on, a, on a fire. Yapmış olduğunuz hamur bu bunun içerisine giriyor. And then you place the dough inside. And uh, close it off, close the top with some uh, leaves. Bu ailelerin durumuna göre mesela 4 saatte pişen de var. Geceden koyup sabaha kadar pişen de var. So there's different types of stones. Some take longer, some are shorter. Some you kind of have to cook like overnight, and some can uh, be stones that you can cook in a few hours. It depends, I guess, on uh, the type of stone. Well, this was wonderful. I'm afraid I know that Musa has just a wealth of information, um, and we could probably learn so much more, but I'm afraid we need to continue on with the program. Um, but we do have Musa and Barack staying on um, for a little bit longer. They're going to be in the Meet the Author booth uh, during our break later on. So hopefully Musa will still have his whole setup and be able to talk more about this stone and all sorts of great um, Turkish culinary delights. So thank you again, Musa and Barak, and we'll see you in a little bit. All right, before jumping into the next session, just want to remind you all that we have a new poll question up, which actually ties into our next session, um, which is about how this year's events have expanded the role of restaurants in local communities. Um, we have a last minute change to the schedule as unfortunately for us, but very fortunately for him, Ben Shuri of Attica in Melbourne is no longer able to chat with us since he's in the midst of resuming operations. Uh, not to worry, though, we have an incredible session lined up for you with Michael Legbade, who is coming to us direct from Lagos, Nigeria. And we hope you'll join in the conversation by entering your questions throughout the session in the chat. Michael is a graduate of the CIA at Greystone and spent several years at top kitchens in the States before returning to Nigeria, where he's now the chef owner of Atan Test Kitchen. Welcome to Worlds of Flavor, Michael. Hi, Jackie. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, I know you've got a video prepared for us, but before we get there, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Aton Test Kitchen? Well, Aton Test Kitchen is located in Lagos, and what we do here is um, by by how it, what its name suggests, it means story or history in Yoruba. So that's what we do. We tell a story and history of Nigerian food, culture, traditions through a culinary experience. It's also a place of education 
Uh, we train a lot of upcoming uh, chefs um, in the standards and to understand the ingredients and use our local ingredients in the best way possible. And I know that you're actually, I feel like I can't resist this. You're in the kitchen of your test kitchen. We just came from the kitchen <laughs> tours of everybody else. We probably don't have time to see the whole thing, but can you maybe turn your laptop a little All bit? Right. Just give people a little preview of let's what they're missing out on. So we have our, the, the, the tree here. And then we have this long dining table that leads into the garden where we begin a lot of the experiences that uh, we have in the test kitchen. Awesome, so beautiful. Thank you for that quick sneak welcome. peek. Um, so we've got this video coming up um, and in it you're showcasing Millet. Before we jump to the video, can you tell us a little bit more about how Millet plays into your ethos, um, both at Eton and the work that you do overall? Mm -hmm. Well, um, millets is primarily used in the northern part of Nigeria, and it's used for from you know things like couscous, which is called butabisco, to uh, mil, uh, kunu. Kunu zake is a fermented millet drink um, that is used for uh, both the fermentation properties to the pure uh, energy that the carbs give uh, from the millet. And that's very, very important to us because we grow it a lot in the north and it's something that is local and indigenous. And here at the Chontas Kitchen, we like to use the, everything that we use. We like it to come from Nigeria and we like it to have all the benefits and all the realities that are needed for a nutrition meal. Awesome. And we'll talk more about sort of your sourcing philosophy and kind of building up those appetites um, in Nigeria in just a bit. But first, let's check out your millet stir fry. So talk us through yeah, what um, we're seeing here. Definitely. So this is a very uh, quick meal that you can make at home. So I'm using whole grains uh, millet. And what I've done, I'm heating up the pan just to get the pan really, really hot. You can use um, whichever oil, preferably olive oil, to um, cook your shrimps or prawns. So I'm getting a little bit of color in it for uh, flavor and also to get that little um, Maillard reaction on it. Um, then once you know I get the color, I put it to the side then I start using a lot of the vegetables that I have. So I have some Julianne's onions uh, with some green and red bell pepper. I let that sweat a little bit. Then I add um, some other ingredients that we have. So I have some scotch bonnets, we have uh, some ginger, garlic, and we're gonna allow that to sweat a little bit more before adding sweet corn. We have sweet corn in season right now in Lagos. So I've added a little bit of that. Um, allowed that to, you know, marinate a little bit, add some salt, some pepper. You can add some grains of paradise, some calabash nutmeg if you'd like. Uh, those are some of the indigenous spices that we use. And then we add the whole grain millet that has been cooked with some stock and um, um, uh, ghee from the north. Uh, it, they use a lot of ghee in uh, their preparation. So we now finish it with the prawns that we cooked earlier or shrimp. And then there you go, you enjoy a very fresh, delicious um, millet dish. That is awesome, Michael. It looks so delicious. And you were talking a little bit about sort of the sustainability and the nutritious elements of that. And I feel like that ties into your overall ethos and the work that you do at Aton in terms of building up Nigerian cuisine um, and, and sort of bringing things back to local suppliers. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? I know, for instance, you've got the garden that's outside of your kitchen where you're working on things, but you've also sort of built up a network of local suppliers, haven't you? Definitely. I think, you know, um, coming back to Nigeria over four years ago, um, one of the things that I found really challenging was the accessibility to ingredients that I knew that we grew um, locally uh, and we can grow locally. So um, working with local farmers and organic farmers and then bringing that awareness 
um, to people everywhere. Uh, you know, that, that was very, very important to me, um, especially because the test kitchen, we only use ingredients that are local. So making sure we have that system of sustainable uh, uh, access to those ingredients are very important and making sure they're also really, really good. Um, and creating like the, removing the perception that have often, you know, uh, been the narrative of Nigerian ingredients where, you know, most people think ingredients from other parts of the world are better than ours. Um, and what the test kitchen, you know, tends to do is using those ingredients and showing how beautiful they are, showing how delicious they are, and showing that what we grow is just as good, if not sometimes better than anything that can come into the country. Less footprint and also sustaining the ecosystem that should support the culinary industry here in the US. Yeah. And we've got some questions coming in actually about some of those ingredients, about the millet um, that, that mm. you are cooking. Um, we have a question from Lori asking, how long does it take to cook the whole grain millet? The whole grain millet actually takes just about 20 minutes. It's very, uh, just boil water, um, add your, if you have ghee, if you have butter, add a little of the butter, season the water and add your millet, let it come to a boil, cover it. And with, depending on the quantity you're cooking within uh, 15 to 20 minutes, it's perfectly fluffy and cooked. And do you do it in a kind of, you know, where um, all of the liquid is absorbed or would you use kind of a pasta method where once it's done, you could train the excess liquid? All of the liquid is absorbed. Uh, gotcha. by millet. Awesome. Um, and then we also have a question from Lisa asking, what type of stock do you cook the millet in? So uh, since we were using shrimp, uh, we used uh, prawn stock. We add some prawn stock in the kitchen, so we use, but you can use any stock, uh, it's, you know, to add and intensify the flavor. So chicken stock, if you have some fish stock, you know, just anything that intensifies the flavor. But the millet on its own, you can make it as a vegan uh, course and it would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I should remind um, the other attendees out there also, but please do put your questions for Michael in the chat so that we can um, we can pose them to him up here. I've got some other questions in the meantime. Um, I wonder, Michael, if you could tell us a little bit more about what the current food culture looks like in Lagos um, and sort of um, how you're building an appreciation for a different kind of food that you're bringing in into that picture? You know, uh, Lagos, uh, um, we've always been, our culinary culture has always, you know, revered uh, cuisines from other parts of the world um, a lot more than we did ours, especially when it came to, you know, more um, uh, experiential and uh, in many ways, uh, you know, even upscale casual experiences. So what, you know, what this is, it's bringing, Itontes Kitchen is bringing a diversity and a new narrative to how we can experience our own food. You know, just when you want to go out for a nice meal, you don't have to always go to a French restaurant or an Asian restaurant or a Lebanese restaurant or an American restaurant. We can also experience, uh, have a good experience within our own culture, narrating our own story. Um, and obviously there's nothing, I go to those restaurants, there's nothing wrong with those experiences. Um, what we need to now begin to have more conversations and more realities about is what it, where does our cuisine play a role? And that's what Itan has brought to the conversation. Here is Nigeria, here's our cuisine, here's our culture, and we can experience it in ways that are just, just as good, you know. And have you noticed the pandemic and sort of what's happening with the pandemic sort of changing how people approach that kind of development of the food culture? Absolutely. You know, uh, we, we Nigerians, we're very well traveled. So more, more often we're always going out, traveling to experience, you know, different experiences around food and around fashion, around, you know, just a lot of things. And, you know, having to stay home, um, I think we started looking for different experiences that, you know, 
um, not necessarily reminded us of what you know we experience when we travel, but also just things that are remarkable, things that are exciting. So it's just been incredible that you know um, the the clients, uh, the local clientele, and even the experts that are still here, and how we you know they are interacting with the test kitchen. It's allowed a more of a inward um, appreciation of our food. And, you know, like even to the ingredients, you know, because things are not, the influx of food is decreased into the country due to the pandemic. You, we find that a lot more people are looking at Nigerian ingredients and wanting to know more about how we use our grains, our beans, our, you know, just things that are indigenous to us. And, um, you know, when the test kitchen first did its first uh, lockdown, uh, we launched um, Abori as, as well with um, Ozla Suko, which uh, you spoke with earlier, the Abori uh, marketplace platform, uh, which, you know, it brought together all of the, a lot of the people producing uh, produce locally and um, food products that are made with local indigenous uh, produce into one platform so people can have access to them and sustain, continue to sustain that uh, reality of our food system. Yeah, I think we definitely coming out of pandemic, people everywhere are kind of talking about um, smaller food chains, right? Smaller footprints, paying more attention to what's happening locally. Um, this conversation could clearly go on forever, um, but unfortunately, we actually need to take a hop to another African country. So thank you so much, Michael. Hopefully, um, you'll hang out in the chat. We've got lots of people with questions about how to prepare millet, so maybe they can chat with you directly um, or in the event chat. But again, thank you so much for sharing your expertise from Nigeria. All right, and now let's welcome back Anne McBride as we jet over to Accra, Ghana. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thank you, Michael. Um, and it's a, a real treat to take our next journey. Selassie Atadika is the chef and founder of Midunu in Accra, Ghana, a finalist of the Basque Culinary Center World Prize and a Stone Barnes Fellow, among many, many accomplishments. And she is also a chocolate maker. And I'm very happy to tell you that her chocolates made with ingredients from Ghana are now available in the US at midunuchocolates.com. Um, great place for your holiday presents. Uh, we've learned a lot from Selassie uh, over the course of programs she has joined, in, joined us in, but we've never been on the streets of Accra with her. So we're so excited to get to do that. Welcome, Selassie. Hi, how are you? Good. So <laughs> great. better now that I'm with you. <laughs> just before we start, I was going to just uh, say that I was recently at Michael's Test Kitchen a couple of weeks ago in Lagos, and it was amazing. Um, and so, um, yeah, I wanted to take you guys on a little bit of a food tour. I am obsessed with plantain. And um, in Accra, we have a lot of different street food that's centered around plantain. The first one is something we call Kofi Brokman. Um, it's like roasted plantain and groundnuts or peanuts. Um, we have other ones called Kelewele, which is sort of like a super ripe plantain that's fried with ginger and some of the spices that Michael was talking about, the calabash nutmeg. Um, Aden fruit and some other ones. And um, I actually, there's one that I really love that you don't see very much in Accra. Um, it's called Ababoy and Tatali. Tatali is the plantain component. Um, so yeah, let's take a, a trip down into the streets of Accra. If you can roll the footage. <laughs> So here we are, this is Adabraka. It's one of the old areas of um, Accra. Um, this is one of my favorite spots. We're about to go and meet the women that work here. Um, they sell tatali and aboboy. And um, I just love this stuff. I've actually, um, I've almost missed a flight because of my love for this. Um, 
the story was that I was in, um, I was flying into Accra from uh, Senegal on my way to Liberia. While I was in transit, I decided to hop in a taxi, come here and grab some tatali. On the way back, I got stuck in traffic and almost missed my flight. But honestly, this stuff is so good. It was totally worth the risk. So let's go in and meet them. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine, and you? Fine, thank you. And your name? I'm good. Harriet Hilda in Cancer. Okay. Or um, Sika. And the name of the company? Oh, Grace Special Totally in Abu Okay. So I came here today because it's one of my favorite places. For the last 10 years, every time I'm in Accra, I always come. And I moved back six years ago. And um, honestly, it's the it's like my happy place. So I love plantain. Anything with plantain, I just absolutely love plantain. Um, just if you could tell me about how long the business has been running. Um, this business has been run for the past 40 years. For 40 years. Okay. My mom started it, I think, 1977. Mm -hmm. Before she even gave birth to me. Okay. So I've been helping her during school vacation. And after school, I worked for some time. And I decided to join her to do the business okay so um it's what what do you prepare here it's called tatale and aboboy okay locally and then the beans is a um, bambara beans okay and the plantain it's the black plantain yeah it's ripe plantain mm -hmm. mixed with flour and pepper okay and then you fry it with oil okay so can we take a look and see how it's uh, being made yes okay yeah this is the beans okay this is uh, the bambara beans yes Okay. We cook it, we boil it, and then add pepper and okay. salt to it for taste. Okay. And then the plantain should be very ripe. Okay. So that mashing it will be very easier and it brings out the taste well when it's very ripe. Okay. So this is the, the plantain, mm -hmm. the ripe plantain mixed with flour and pepper. Okay. So we mix it together mm -hmm. to become a paste okay so after the paste then we fry it in this frying pan okay we grease it at first with oil mm -hmm. just to hold it so that it will not uh, stick it will not stick into the pan mm -hmm. and then this is how we come out we use a just a little oil it's a shallow frying so we don't need much oil okay. so we just add a little oil to grease it mm -hmm. and then this is how it is. So this is the fresh one. We turn it and then it becomes like this. And then if you can eat right after here. You can take it any time of the day. Okay. And most people, do they eat it um, for lunch or dinner or which it's, time? It's mostly for lunch. Mostly for lunch because yeah. it's a bit heavier. Yes. And, yes. Um, and because of the beans, most people don't, can't eat beans in the night. In the night. Okay. So they prefer taking it between 9 to 4 30 in the evening. Okay. I'll definitely be taking some today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, who are the clients and who comes here? Um, most of client, our uh, clients are workers. Okay. So government workers and then private workers. Mm -hmm. During their break time, we pass by mm -hmm. to buy. Some people take it here, others take it away. Okay. We do delivery services to their officers as well. Okay. Sometimes when there's a program naming ceremony, funerals and parties, we do cater for those occasions too. Okay. Either we go there to prepare it there for them, or they come here to buy it and go and sell it. So um, you said that you started the, the um, you took the business over from your mother. Yes. Okay. So is she around? Yes, she's around. Okay. This is my mother. She's I can see the resemblance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she started it before giving birth to me. So after some time, after schooling and working for some time, I've decided to come and be part to be with her to support her in the business. And then, do you have any other sisters? Yes. Do they do they also help out? Yes. Yes. Okay. My, we work with my cousins. Okay. And then I have two brothers as well. The brothers are also involved in the business? No, because okay. they are men, they are doing other jobs <laughs> and the ladies are doing it. Okay. 
so even here we have a COVID um, setup for hand washing. So um, there's water, soap, uh, towel, uh, paper towels uh, to wash your hands. So now it's time for me to go in and enjoy my tatali and agogoi. You're invited. Vami dunu. So what do we got? Oh, wow, it's fantastic. Thank you so much. So um, there you can see the beans. Um, I didn't take mine with sugar. I find that the plantain is sweet enough for me. Um, and I'll take a few bites and tell you what I taste. Um, so I'm just gonna go in and, and enjoy. Uh, so the beans, um, they've been slow cooked. Um, there's a little tiny bit of tomato. That's the pink that you see in there. Mm. The beans are really creamy and rich um, with flavor. There's definitely a little bit of heat in there. And I love the combination because the plantain, the ripe plantain is sweet and it brings a nice sweetness to a very savory dish. Um, it's delicious. Well, I definitely want to go and sit down and have a plate of this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so Celestia, uh, Bambara beans are grown underground like peanuts, right? Um, exactly. Can you talk a little bit more about them? Are they from a particular region of Ghana or how widely used are they? Um, you get them actually uh, within, I guess, West Africa. Bambara are the people from, um, traditionally there you can find um, that population in Mali. So basically it's kind of um, around that region. So it's kind of spanning from Mali, Northern Ghana, um, I believe northern Nigeria as well. Um, they kind of have a a texture similar to, and a look similar to um, chickpeas, um, but they're not the same. They grow underground and some of them can be black, some of them can be black and white. Um, and um, there are lots of different dishes that are made out of them, but they have a beautiful creaminess um, that comes through um, when you're cooking them. Are they always cooked the, the way we saw them um... In, in your video, or are there a lot of different preparations around it? Yeah, there are a couple of different preparations. Another way of doing it is actually just boiling them. This is like a breakfast dish. It's similar to ful, um that you would find in Sudan and some of the, the Middle Eastern countries. It's boiled, and then we sort of finish them off with a bit of shea butter. So for us, mm -hmm. shea butter is not just um, for cosmetics. <laughs> um, we use it a lot in our, in our cooking and a little bit of sort of um, cooked onions. Um, there's another uh, version where they're... Um, you boil them, or sorry, you soak them, you remove the skin from them, and they're blended, and then they're steamed. So it's, I um, uh, forget the name, there's like an Italian dish that's similar, but it's something that's sort of like a steam cake made out of these, um, sort of like a bean puree um, that we could, you can eat as well. It's called tubani uh, in the northern part of Ghana. So there's a few different preparations. I think that I just, I find that um, they're underutilized, not enough people know about them. And, um, you know, they fix the soil. So it's something that's really great to have in this time to sort of um, work on improving our soil quality. And someone is asking if they're sold dried or canned. Um, in Ghana, you find them mostly uh, dry. Um, I think it's a, something that in terms of agro-processing, it would be great to start seeing more of it canned. Um, I always soak them because it takes a shorter time to cook them um, once they've been soaked overnight. And you mentioned also that you took the dish without sugar. Is Ghanaian yeah. cuisine particularly sweet? No, I mean, I would say we're particularly savory, savory but when we like sweet, we like sweet. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but most of our dishes happen to be savory. I'm not sure why. Um, I didn't show it in the footage, but like in Ghana, that specific dish is always served with like a sprinkle of sugar on top of it. And I really don't understand why, because, you know, ripe plantain are quite sweet on their own. Um, but for some reason, that's just like a tradition that people always do. Um, but yeah, in general, we tend to be a little bit more like sort of heat, bold flavors from the spices, from fermented elements such as like dawa dawa, the fermented locust bean. Um, other things could be like a smoked um, or fermented fish that comes into a lot of our, our dishes. Yeah. Great. And in the 30 seconds we have left, tell us about some of the Ghanaian ingredient that you use in your chocolates, because I'm sure there's a lot of curiosity there. Yeah, some of the ones that Michael mentioned um, uh, previously that are found also in Nigerian cuisine. Um, my idea really is how do I introduce people to flavors that they haven't experienced before? And I thought chocolate was a perfect medium. So we do our chocolates um, with some calabash nutmeg, with uh, saline peppers, 
um, Aiden Fruit or Precase. And um, we actually just launched um, today our website, um, medinuchocolates.com. Um, and so they are currently available in the US in limited supply. So. Great. So after everyone leaves World of Flavor in about 30 minutes, you had uh, <laughs> stock up on chocolate. Thank you so much, Selassie. Thank and you. Hope that you can hang out in the chat a little bit for more questions as well. Uh, such a treat to see you. Uh, and you can see all of the videos, including Selassie's, in the uh, resources. And my colleague Shara also just put a direct link in the chat if you want to rewatch it. So we are now heading into our networking reception and sponsor expo. And remember that the more you participate, the more chances you get to win great prizes like cookbooks by our fantastic talents. And if you participate every day in everything, you'll get to enter in a raffle for our conference next year in California, including travel. The networking topic for our four minute networking roulette is what is the next food focused trip you're going to take once we can travel again? Musa Dagdaviren is in our Meet the Author booth where you can buy his incredibly thorough Turkish cookbook and ask him lots of questions. Burak will be with him. You don't have to uh, learn Turkish by then. And our entertainment comes courtesy of the West African Cultural Arts Institute performers who will perform a Guinean dance and drumming show. And here's a food full schedule of the themes featured in the Sponsor Expo to help guide your journey. Enjoy the reception for the next 30 minutes and come back here tomorrow starting at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, where we'll hear about the culinary traditions of rural North Carolina, the Louisiana Bayous, Uganda. We'll have our first panel featuring chefs who've been particularly entrepreneurial during the pandemic. We'll get a live plan forward cooking demo with a full meal and a cocktail, and you'll get global ideas for breakfast, barbecue and snacks. Enjoy the reception and see you here tomorrow.